Hi everybody, I'm Brian Mallow, coming to you once again from Lindau, Germany, where it's the week of the 71st annual Lindau Nobel Laureate meeting. And I am speaking to one of the 600 young scientists that's participating in this year's meeting. Let me introduce you to Dr. Carla Casadeval Serrano from the University of Cambridge. Hi, Carla. Hello. Thanks for being here. And uh, you are a doctor, you are a postdoc. How long ago did you complete? I forgot to ask you how long ago you completed your PhD. Yeah, I, I finished my, my PhD in July 2019, so it's about oh. three years ago. Okay, and you said you're moving on from, you're only a postdoc for a little while longer, right? Yeah. What's the next stage? So that's a very good question. I'm, I'm starting my own research group in October. So I'm very excited about it because it's kind of my, my dream come true. I, I think everyone or most of us who go into the academic path and like, you know, doing a PhD, then a postdoc, eventually want to have this chance. Now, I'm not great with accents, but that's not really an English accent you have there, is it? Uh, coming no. from the University of Cambridge. Um, and that's not really a very English sounding name you have. So where are you from? Yeah, that you pointed it totally right. Yeah, I'm I'm Spanish. I'm yeah. I'm from Girona. I don't know if you know it. No. Girona is one hour north from Barcelona. Nice. So And I'll bet so tell me where else you've worked before you wound up at Cambridge. How, where has your academic path taken you? So I studied my bachelor in chemistry in Girona, and I also did a master's in advanced catal catalysis and molecular modeling in Girona as well, in the same university. And then I moved to ICIQ, which is the Institute of Chemical Research of Catalonia. And it's a center of that, that is recognized for the research in catalysis. So I did my PhD there. And then when I finished my PhD, I started at the University of Cambridge as a postdoc. And soon after I started, I was awarded a Marie Curie Individual Fellowship. And this is my current position now in Cambridge. So I'm going to ask you about what kind of chemistry you do. But I noticed that probably the, at this year's chemistry themed meeting, the word that I've heard the very most throughout the whole week, through every interview and every session is catalysis. That has got to be the key word of the whole meeting. So I know that this, so it has to do with catalysts, the process of catal catalysis, but um, why is it that that, like everyone seems to be working on that. It's why is that so important and the focus of so many people in so many different parts of chemistry? It's always about catalysis, it seems. That's, I'm very glad you asked this question because it's very important for our current problem in society. You know? It's very important to the current energy problem. So we still have a, a society that depends very much on fossil fuels and non-renewable sources to obtain not only the fuels we need, but also our chemical commodities that we use, right? So if we want to change this and move towards a more sustainable society, we need to change how we obtain the fuels and how we obtain the chemical commodities that we need. And to do so, catalysis is the key. So catalysis, it's what will make the change because it's only by changing our current way to make these chemical commodities that we are gonna be able to transition to a sustainable society and we are going to be able to allow the future generations to have access to energy and to have access to the same chemical, com uh, to the same commodities that we use in our daily lives. Catalysis has the key to be able to develop much uh, sustainable and um, environmentally friendly procedures to be able to access those medicines, um, um, fertilizers, food preservatives, fuels. So that's why it's so important. And that's why pretty much a lot of people that are chemists or even in the field of physical chemistry or um, material science or nanotechnology are working towards that. Interesting. So better catalysts can be more efficient reactions and less use of 
perhaps environmentally unfriendly products. Okay, it's been kind of almost funny how often I've heard the word without having, as a non-scientist, without having the most complete um, understanding. So tell me about your research. What, uh, what are you working on these days? So I work on catalysis as well, <laughs> but my and my catalysis is more oriented in the field of energy. So I work in something that nowadays is called artificial photosynthesis. So my goal is to mimic natural photosynthesis. That is what plants do. So plants and photosynthetic uh, microorganisms are able to mix uh, water sunlight and carbon dioxide and obtain sugars right they are able to obtain the energy that they need to sustain their growth to sustain their life but actually they are the ones who are sustaining life on earth thanks to this process so my research is trying is, is focused on mimicking this natural process and using these simplest building blocks which are water carbon dioxide and sunlight to access this fuels and the chemical feedstock that we need to generate the different chemical commodities that we use. And do you actually generate sugars or some? are you generating some other kind of carbon compounds? We are still far, unfortunately, to make sugars. This is uh, something that a lot of groups are trying to do now as well. This is something that myself would like to achieve. But nowadays, for instance, we know how to do quite well seeing gas, which is CO and hydrogen, that is also very useful for the industry. We start to get a bit of knowledge on, on how to, to, well, we also know how to make methane and a bit methanol, which is a liquid fuel per se, but we need to move towards making carbon-carbon bonds, carbon-carbon products, because these are more relevant for the chemical industry. Why, why would you want to be able to make sugars? What would be the significance or importance of that? So if we can make sugars, these are precursors that we can use later on to make other kind of products, right? It's For instance, if we were able to make ethylene, which is a, it has two carbons, is a molecule that has two carbons, which can be simple uh, when you say it, we would be able to do polymerizations and obtain the different polymers that we use, right? Which is very important. And we would be able to obtain all those polymers just starting by carbon dioxide, then transforming it to ethylene, and then, you know, run all the different transformations to obtain the different compounds. Interesting. So before you came here, are there any Nobel laureates whose work is relevant to yours and perhaps you were looking forward to meeting him at this meeting? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, uh, the, the work of uh, Macmillan or Benjamin List is very close to my field of research. It's like photocatalysis, like driven chemistry, right, in, in the case of Macmillan, right? So I was really looking forward to meet them and also like to hear about their experience, right? But I also like a lot the work of um, Ben Feringa, he's, or, or Jan Marilene, because they both are working on supramolecular chemistry. And this is also very important to design new applications and new catalysts. Excellent. And have you had a chance to interact with them under? Tell me this, because there's so many, you know, so many conferences just have lectures but here at Lindau there's so many different types of sessions and then opportunities like social situations so tell me uh describe some of the situations uh and some of the highlights you've had so far so Lindau this Lindau meeting is a very unique place because as you said you have the chance to go beyond the lectures and actually talk on a face-to-face -face, like you know as if you were just going for a coffee or a pub uh, with the Nobel laureates, right? So I had the chance to be on a, an open discussion with uh, Ben Feringa. After he gave his lecture, a lot of young scientists went in one of the conference room and had the opportunity to chat with him and ask him questions. So it was very good because we had the chance to approach him and ask uh, about his research and about his career and all the questions that we had. And then I was um, very lucky to attend 
a panel discussion on catalysis and green chemistry with Professor Schrock and Professor Macmillan as well. And it, it was great because I had the chance to discuss with the experts about where the field of catalysis and green chemistry should do should go, what should we do to improve our ways to discover new systems or make more sustainable systems. So it was great. And now I just had the chance to go into an open exchange with uh, Benjamin Liszt. So it was very great as well to see his opinion on a lot of topics yeah. and you know have his advice on on how to start your group and how to which which problems to to work on that's fantastic um so you're having fun at the meeting yes yeah did it live up to your expectations honestly yeah it, it overpassed them I, I thought i it would be different i never thought it would be so unique in the sense that you can approach very easily the Nobel laureates, right? I think sometimes when, as a young researcher, we see them as kind of gods, right? At least the impression I had is that they were like up there and it was like, you know, why would they be interested to to talk to me, right? Because I'm just a postdoc, right? But the sensation I get after being here is that they are actually willing and eager to talk to young scientists because we are the ones who are the future, right, of, of science. So it's a fantastic feeling. That's so great. I love that. And I don't know where to go next. We, there's so many things that uh, you already said, but um, the uh, your love of science, you obviously love what you do. Um, did you always know you were going to be in this sort of field? Yeah, I mean, since I'm like 15, since I was 15 years old, I mean, I, I always was very curious as a child. I mean, I would always hit in my room and steal things at, around my house to be able to do experiments in my room. I even set my bed on fire when I was six oh. years old because I was doing experiments. My grandmother was not very happy about it, uh, but okay, I guess it's the curiosity that... Uh, put me where I am today. So I'm quite glad and proud about it. And when I was 15, it was very clear to me that I wanted to do a scientific career, become a scientist and and just devote my life to it because I'm very passionate of what I do. I really love it. I feel it. You know, I, I get uh, emotional when something works. I get very frustrated when something is not working. But actually, I feel that this, this same frustration <laughs> that helps me keep up and, and, you know, and try harder and move on. So, yeah, since I was like 15 years old, I wanted to do science. I was in between chemistry and physics. But then I, I at that time, I liked a lot wet lab. So I decided that maybe chemistry was the path to follow. And I'm, I'm very glad I followed that path. That's excellent. Do you get frustrated? There's so many uh, mis conceptions and myths about science in the public's eye and maybe especially with chemistry are there anything in particular like myths or misconceptions or things that you wish the public understood about chemistry i think there is a bad promotion and advertisement of of chemistry normally chemistry is associated to pollution to genetically modified organisms, things that uh, seem, seem bad, right? Nobody acknowledged the importance of science and especially chemistry in medicine, in the develop of medicine, in the develop of drugs, you know? And this is something that it's important to communicate to society. Thanks to chemistry, thanks to, the, to fertilizers, we are able to eat, we are able to have food. We are able to preserve the food that we have in our house. Thanks to chemistry, we are able to switch on the light every morning because we have electricity in our house, you know? So I think we need to change the face that, the face that uh, chemistry has in front of the lay people because it's not only about the bad things. 
thanks to the advances in chemistry and in science in general, we are able to live longer now and to live in a much better quality than before. So I think it's very important to highlight that. And in this regard, outreach is very important because I think that as important it is for our job to, to do really well and, re and really good science, I think it's also really, really important and it's the duty of scientists to do outreach because we need to communicate people what we do, why we do it and why it's so important. And the same is with politicians. We need to convince them that it's important to put money on that because it's the key for progress and development and to improve things and live better. Very well said. Um, besides doing this interview with me, what sort of outreach have you participated in? So since I started my, my bachelor studies, my, um, I always participated in science festivals, researchers' night. I always was uh, going to schools to talk about what I do and to do experiments with kids because I think it's very important to motivate this young generation. It's very important to start at school level to motivate children to study sciences, not only chemistry, but in general sciences, because they are going to be the future scientists, right? So it's very important to motivate them. And also during my PhD, I was doing the same. And even now I keep doing a lot of outreach. So for instance, with um, some other colleagues from Spain, Cambridge and Stanford University, we are organizing a summer camp that actually started this week, but I'm going to join next week because it's a two week summer camp in which we are this is together uh, organized together with a foundation from spain which is called la padrera ciencia and we are doing a summer camp on artificial photosynthesis because it's what my colleagues and myself work on and it's great because during this week and next week we are teaching the the uh, teenagers from 16 to 17 years old why we, uh, what we are doing, what uh, artificial photosynthesis is, what does it mean, uh, what is natural photosynthesis, which are, what is a catalyst, um, and the, the importance of putting that together and work in this field. Excellent. You know, we've already talked quite a long time. I think I could talk to you quite a bit longer, and I'd love to talk to you about art i love the idea of artificial photosynthesis and a few years ago at another chemistry meeting here i spoke to another young scientist about it and i feel like i asked him well how close are we to the efficiency of leaves and i think he said we're actually beyond that efficient is that correct yeah we are beyond i mean natural photosynthesis is not very efficient in converting solar lights into the sugars, in, into energy, because it's it was not made to sustain the whole energy demand of the planet. It was meant to sustain the life and the growth of a plant and therefore sustain life on Earth, because obviously we get oxygen from photosynthesis, right? Um, and also we, we have the food from plants. Um, but actually, the the efficiency of photosynthetic organisms is like beyond one percent. It's zero point six percent in the best case, and we are beyond that now. That's we excellent. Still, we are still not. I'm sorry, we are not still where we should be, but we are we are way beyond that. We're not where we should be, but we're beyond nature. And nature has had a yeah. millions of years head start, hundreds of millions of years head start. <laughs> You know, is there any chance of like, obviously the solution to anthropogenic climate change is not, is, is in us cutting back the carbon we put into the air, but people often talk about engineering methods to remove it. Um, or is it, it sounds like this is could be related to that sort of catalysis and efforts to, to, to artificial photosynthesis wouldn't it be taking carbon out of the air potentially? Yeah, I think a lot of research in artificial photosynthesis tries to actually work at um, co um, atmospheric concentrations or on of carbon dioxide because the idea is to uh, instead of putting a a cylinder of uh, of carbon dioxide, use the carbon dioxide that we have on the atmosphere, right? 
all this waste gas. And also another idea is first to have methods to capture the carbon dioxide and store it and then be able to use it and, and doing catalysis to transform it into useful fuels and, prod and, and compounds. The thing is that now normally amine compounds are used to do the CO2 capture and we don't have enough space uh, to put all the towers to do this capture, right? So, you know, we need to improve. Uh, there are a lot of, um, th there is a lot of research on porous materials to do this waste gas storage as well. So, you know, a lot of research now is going on towards tackling the energy crisis. So I think we're going to have great discoveries out of it. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. This has been fantastic. And I know that there's so much going on there that, that I don't want to keep you from it all. And tonight's Bavarian evening will be a lot of fun. And if I'm lucky, I might see you tomorrow and I might finally I get, outside, get outside this hotel room. <laughs> I hope so. I really hope so. So thank you very much, Dr. Carla Casadeval Serrano. And uh, just, it's amazing how uh, the, the, the quality of scientists here, not just the Nobel laureates, but what we call the young scientists, which is anyone under 35. Some of them are undergrads, grad students, PhD students, postdocs, and beginning the next stage of their career. Um, like Carla is. So thank you very much. This has been Brian Mallow and the 71st annual Lindau Nobel Laureate Meeting.